Chapter 9 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe In the Witch's House And now, of course, you want to know what had happened to Edmund. He had eaten his share of the dinner, but he hadn't really enjoyed it because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation and hadn't enjoyed it much either, because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him in trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver told them about Aslan, and until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table. It was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door, for the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, just as it gave the others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle, and just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them that the white witch wasn't really human at all, but half a gin and half a giantess, Edmund had gotten outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brothers and sisters to be turned into stone. He did want Turkish delight and to be a prince and later a king and to pay Peter out for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do to the others, he didn't want her to be particularly nice to them, certainly not put them on the same level of, as himself. But he managed to believe, or to pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them, because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me anyway, much nicer than they are. I expect she is the rightful queen, really. Anyway, she'll be better than that awful Aslan. At least that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside him, he really knew that the White Witch was bad and cruel. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling all around him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house, and of course there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone, for it had been nearly three o'clock when they sat down to dinner, and the winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it, so he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam. Luckily, it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen, to the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute, and what with that and the snowflakes swirling all around him, he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then, too, there was no road. He kept slipping into the deep drifts of snow and skidding on frozen puddles and tripping over fallen tree trunks and sliding down steep banks, and barking his shins against rocks till he was wet and cold and bruised all over. The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others if he hadn't happened to say to himself, when I'm king of Narnia, the first thing I shall do will be to make some decent roads. And of course, that set him off thinking about being a king and all the other things he would do, and this cheered him up a good deal. And he had settled, just settled in his mind, what sort of palace he would have, and how many cars, and all about his private cinema, and where the principal rail railways would run, and what laws he would make against beavers and dams, and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter in his place when the weather changed. First, the snow stopped. Then, 
a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled away and the moon came out. It was a full moon and shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day. Only the shadows were rather confusing. He would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out by the time he had gotten to the other river. You remember, he had seen, when they first arrived at the beavers, a smaller river flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up. But the little valley down which it came was much steeper and rockier than the one that he had just left and much overgrown with bushes so that he could not have managed it at all in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through, uh, for he had to stoop under branches, and great loads of snow came sliding off onto his back. And every time this happened, he thought more and more how he hated Peter, just as if all of this had been Peter's fault. But at last he came to the part where it was more level and the valley opened out. And there, on the other side of the river, quite close to him, in the middle of the little plain between the two hills, he saw what must be the white witch's house. And the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers, little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. They looked like huge dunces caps or sorcerers caps. And they shone in the moonlight, and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house. But it was too late to think of turning back now. He crossed a river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring, not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deep, newly fallen snow. He walked on and on, past corner after corner of the house, and past turret after turret to find the door. He had to go right around to the far side before he found it. It was a large arch, but the great iron gate stood wide open. Edmund crept up to the arch and looked inside into the courtyard, and there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion, crouched as if it were ready to spring. And Edmund stood in the shadow of the arch, afraid to go on and afraid to go back, and his knees knocking together. He stood there so long that his teeth would have been chattering with cold, even if they had not been chattering with fear. How long this really lasted, I don't know but it seemed to Edmund to last for hours. Then, at last, he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still. For it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. He now saw from the way that the lion was standing that it couldn't have been looking at him at all. but. Supposing it turns its head, thought Edmund. In fact, it was staring at something, something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it, about four or five feet away. Ha ha, thought Edmund, when it springs at the dwarf, then will be my chance to escape. But still, the lion never moved, nor did the dwarf. And now at last Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion. And as soon as he had thought of that, he noticed that the lion's back and the top of his head were covered with snow. Of course it must be only a statue. No living animal would have let itself get covered with snow. Then, very slowly, and with his heart beating as if it would burst, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now he hardly dared to touch it, but at last he put out his hand very quickly and did. It was cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. 
The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over, right down to his toes, and at the same time, there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan, and they were all talking about him. She's caught him already and turned him into stone. So, that's the end of all their fine ideas about him. Pooh, who's afraid of Aslan? And he stood there, gloating over the stone lion, and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip, and then a pair of spectacles on his eyes. Then he said, Yeah, silly old Aslan, how do you like being a stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it, the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad and noble, staring up in the moonlight that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of the jeering at all. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. As he got into the middle of it, he saw that there were dozens of statues all about, standing here and there, rather as the pieces stand on a chessboard when it's halfway through the game. There were stone satires, there were stone wolves, and bears, and foxes, and catamountains of stone. There were lovely stone shapes that looked like women, but who were really the spirits of trees. There was the great shape of a centaur and a winged horse and a long, lithe creature that Edmund took to be a dragon. They all looked so strange standing there perfectly lifelike and also perfectly still in the bright, cold moonlight. And it was eerie work crossing the courtyard. Right in the very middle stood a huge shape like a man, but it was tall as a tree with a fierce face and a shaggy beard and a great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant and not a live one, Edmund did not like going past it. He now saw that there was a dim light showing from a doorway on the far side of the courtyard. He went to it. There was a flight of stone steps going up to the open door. Edmund went up them across the threshold lay a great wolf. It's all right. It's all right, he kept saying to himself. It's only a stone wolf. It can't hurt me. And he raised his leg to step over it. Instantly, the huge creature rose, and with all the hair bristling along its back, opened a great red mouth and said in a growling voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. If you please, sir, said Edmund, trembling so that he could hardly speak. M my name is Edmund, and, and I'm the son of Adam that Her Majesty met in the wood the other day, and I, I've come to bring her the news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia, quite close, in the beaver's house. She, she wanted to see them. I will tell Her Majesty, said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand here on the threshold, as you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood and waited, his fingers aching with cold and his heart pounding in his chest. And presently the gray wolf, Margram, the chief of the witch's secret police, came bounding back and said, Come in, come in, fortunate favorite of the queen, or else not so fortunate. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long, gloomy hall, with many pillars full, as the courtyard had been, of statues. The nearest one, the door, the nearest one, the door, was a little fawn with a very sad expression on his face. And Edmund couldn't help wondering if this might be Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close beside this sat the white witch. I've come, your majesty, said Edmund, rushing eagerly forward. 
How dare you come alone, said the witch in a terrible voice. Did I not?